Peter Gabriel III introduced the world to Peter's passion for African music, selling hundreds of thousands of copies all over the world. An album that confirmed Gabriel was an artist at the top of his game. One that made Atlantic Records drop him because his music was unsellable. Wait, what? That's right, my dear top patters. Join me in my analysis of Peter Gabriel III and its origins, and by the end of the video you will find out about that colossal Atlantic blunder too. This is Simon Mas, your friend with a master degree in music, a cut on a finger and too much talking already. I think there's an episode that sums up what this album is. Picture 24-year-old producer Steve Lillywhite, someone who had worked in a studio since he was 17, someone who was the go-to producer for a host of cutting-edge new wave acts like Ultravox, Sioux Center Banshees and XTC. When recording XTC's Drums and Wires, Lily White had been offered the job of producing Peter Gabriel's new album. Steve had never really heard of him. Was this Peter guy an old hack trying to be hip? When XTC's Dave Gregory, a huge Gabriel fan, learned Lily White had that chance, he said he simply had to take the job. So Steve reluctantly took the job. Months later, Lily White did a quick remix job for XTC. Gregory recalls, he was so happy, saying things like, there are no symbols, I've never worked with anyone like this. He said it was one of the most exciting things that he had ever worked on, to make someone like Lily White go from reluctant to super excited in the space of a few weeks is something to write home about, I guess. But what's that story about no symbols? Gabriel had wanted to try that idea ever since his first solo album. He thought their sound detracted from the focus on the rhythm, and he wanted to get rid of them. When Peter's drummer Jerry Marotta wasn't convinced, the singer turned to an old friend, Phil Collins. I told him that there are times when using symbols is good, yet, he remained steadfast in wanting no metal on the album, so I got along with it. Collins sat behind the drum kit for three songs on the album, and it was during the early stages of the recording of one of these three that history was made. The invention of gated reverb drums. It all happened by mistake. The new SSL 4000 console had a listen mic button that facilitated the talkback feature. Talkback allows people in the recording space to talk with whoever is in the control room. This talkback featured a heavy compression and a gate to make the musician louder and cut all the low volume noise. After an exchange with Collins, engineer Hugh Patikaham forgot to switch the feature off. When Collins started to play, the tape captured his drum sound and the reverberation in the room. This was already a huge sound thanks to the heavy compression, but when Colin stopped, the gate kicked in and magic happened. Pat Caham remembers when he stopped playing, he sucked the big sound of the room into nothing. It was a huge, strange, unnatural and unsettling sound something nobody else had ever heard before, and it more or less made the drum sound in the first half of the 1980s. It was quickly replicated by Collins in In The Air Tonight, probably THE hit single of that era, and then on countless other records. It was a revolution that started here. Peter Gabriel III is an adventure in which musicians get out of their comfort zone, sometimes achieving new sounds in the process. Gabriel had stopped thinking about instruments in a conventional fashion. He wanted to play with sounds. David Rhodes, Gabriel's guitarist until 2013, commented on his unconventional approach. It was just the fact that I didn't play like most other guitar players because I couldn't. I was technically so inept that I was more interested in ideas and sounds. But does this adventure in new sounds still rewards the listener today? 
Are the actual songs any good? Put a like to this video to hear my views on that and more behind the scenes stories. If you do, more fans like you will see this video, making YouTube aware that people actually want to watch this kind of content. If you don't, this video will melt. Thank you. I'll go straight to the point. In 2023, this is still an album you can't miss for several reasons. The first and plainest is the sheer force of the material. Intruder, starting the record with its new drum sound and unsettling lyrics. Intruder, come and leave this mob. The dramatic song has a film quality of the story of family snapshot. All time quiet. I've been here before. The catchy denunciation of racism of Not One of Us, with some great guitar work by Robert Fripp. <laughs> Peter Gabriel's vocal delivery is really strong. It wasn't weak on the previous albums, but now it's on another level. Lyrically, Check out the vignette closing family snapshot, giving another dimension to the song's villain. But also with Peter's ability of using repetitive melodies and lyrics to shape his characters. Sounding like someone trying desperately to cling to some resemblance of sanity, no self-control, or I don't remember, for example. The only low point for me is Anne Through the Wire. The chorus is a bit too bland for my taste. Like it happened with some Peter Gabriel 2 tracks, it seems an attempt to get an anthem out of nothing. But even Paul Weller's guitar part is a bit disappointing. It doesn't have the impact I was expecting. Anyhow, the album is also really interesting for its three interweaving themes. One, like I said, is the breaking down of one's sanity, a theme so central to the record that it is reflected in its great-looking cover, which also gives the album its nickname, Melt. There's people cracking up, people admitted in mental institutions, people shooting VIPs for a bit of notoriety, a story taken from the diaries of Arthur Bremer, the guy who had shot George Wallace in 1972. People pissing on corpses in the jungle. That bit was inspired by a book about the behavior of American soldiers in Vietnam. Again, this breaking down of sanity was present in Gabriel's previous albums too, but here it is developed in a different way. Music and lyrics are less morbid. I wouldn't say more positive, but you can certainly breathe a bit more freely here. A second theme is a Peter Gabriel's first, direct and clear engagement with political activism. Tracks like Not One of Us and Games Without Frontier are the first steps on a path that will lead Gabriel to become Amnesty International's ambassador of conscience. But I want to use the little time I have left before this section becomes too long to talk about the third element, one, that would become key to much of the rest of Gabriel's career, Peter's fascination with African music. It creeps in ever since the start of Melt, the prominence of strong rhythmic elements. The rhythmic interplay between different instruments. choice of sounds, elements that come together with the political themes in Biko. Here you get actual recordings of people singing traditional songs during Biko's funeral. The lyrics have the cinematic feel already displayed in Family Snapshot. The music is lean and winking at Western sonorities, at least in the bulk of the song, but the drum beat is the whole piece. You can't think about Biko without that. How very African. 
It's a pity to cut this discussion here, but I need to move on to the next section, that of listening suggestions. And since we're talking about suggestions, why don't you subscribe to my channel? Right now, over 90% of my viewers are not subscribers. And yet, I need to hit 1000 subscribers to get fully monetized. YouTube might then give me enough pennies to allow me to start building a team to create more videos for you to watch for free. Click on that button then and let's see what happens. Thank you. If you love Peter Gabriel 3, you'll probably like Phil Collins' face value, tight songwriting and that gated reverb drum sound. And how about XTC's drums and wires? Dave Gregory plays on Melt and Gabriel loved the band. Talking about drums, check out Drums of Passion by Babatunde Olatunji if you want to follow the African connection. Olatunji was also an influence on Gabriel, so you know you can't go wrong. Finally, something from the left field. Dire Straits and their love of gold if you want more songs that play like a whole film. Well, my dear Top Patters, this was Simon Mas and that's it for this video, really. Oh, wait, I promised you the story about Atlantic. Atlantic management had been patient with Peter Gabriel too. They thought it was a weird record, but you know how musicians are. But when the label bosses Amit Ertegan and Jerry Greenberg listened to Tree, they couldn't make sense of it. It was too weird, unlike anything that was going on in the States at the time. Ertegan even asked if Gabriel had had some sort of mental breakdown while recording the music. And the hip guys at the A&R department were with the suits. The album was unsellable, undesirable. So. Atlantic dropped Gabriel. The album release was delayed until Gabriel found another label in the US. In the meantime, Charisma Records, Gabriel's label in the UK, tested the water releasing Games Without Frontier as a single. When the song became a hit in Britain, the folk at Atlantic realized they might have made a mistake. They tried to buy the album back, but Charisma declined. Much to Gabriel's delight, he signed with Mercury for the North American distribution and Melt finally came out in May 1980, ending the year at number 22 on the US Billboard 200 chart. Not bad for an unsellable record, right? See you soon for more music stories. Stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye! Simon Mas, music you love